Hi, welcome to the wider webinar series. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU Wider. Um, and I'm very pleased to chair this session today on the future of development aid in the post COVID world. Aid and development, of course, is a topic that we pay some attention to here at UNU Wider. Uh, in our current work program, we have activities, uh, for instance, on democracy assistance and on aid and state building. And so we're really looking forward uh, to the discussions and reflections today. The webinar will begin with the presentation by Professor Miles Wickstead, uh, Development, Aid and Development, Where We Are, How We Got Here, and Where It Might All Go. And this will be followed by a presentation by Dr. Nalima Gulrajani, who, who will respond to and build on the presentation. So Professor Wickstead is currently visiting professor in international relations at King's College London, an honorary associate professor at the Strategy and Security Institute, University of Exeter. He has a long history of involvement with international development in Africa, including serving as head of uh, the British Development Division in Eastern Africa, serving on the board of the World Bank, uh, and as British ambassador to Ethiopia, Djibouti, and the African Union. His recent book, Aid and Development, A Brief Introduction, was published by Oxford University Press in 2015. Dr. Nalima Golrajani is a senior research fellow at the Overseas Development Institute, ODI, in London, and associate fellow at King's College Department of International Development. She's currently on secondment at the International at the Canadian International Council and the G20 Research Group at the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. Her work uh, applies organizational and management theory uh, to the field of international development cooperation. So welcome to both of you. For those joining us today, uh, you might notice that your microphones are currently muted, uh, but we would encourage you to send questions uh, through the chat and Q&A functions that you should find at the bottom of your Zoom screens today. Um, and after the presentations, we'll open it up to discussion. Uh, as time permits, and I hope we can do this, we'll ask some of you to pose your questions live, and I will unmute you for that purpose. So without further ado, let's turn it over to um, Miles, please. Thank you so much, Rachel. Well, I got through the first hurdle, which is to remember to unmute myself, uh, which uh, we, we still do, don't we, these days? So I'm going to spend 15 or 20 minutes, if I may, just running very quickly through a kind of history of aid and development and how we got to where we are today, and then begin to open up some of the challenges and opportunities that are, that are open to us. And, uh, and uh, Nalima will, of course, uh, add um, flesh to those bones. Um, so, so clearly there's been a very long history of, of, of sort of charity, philanthropy, etc. Paul Vallely has just written a book around two and a half thousand years of uh, philanthropy and, and charity appears, of course, in, uh, in all the sort of religious texts going back a long time. But I think it's reasonable to point to the beginning of the way we think about aid and development um, to, uh, towards the end of the Second World War. And uh, this, this notion of, of development supporting countries to, to get back to or to reach uh, norms uh, really start as, 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 a, as a construct um, uh, from the Second World War uh, and, and, and rebuilding uh, Europe after the, after the devastation. Uh, and um, two sets of institutions were created um, before the end of the Second World War, uh, which remain very much in, in force today. The political organization of the United Nations created on the west coast of uh, the US and, um, and the so-called Bretton Woods institutions, uh, the, the IBRD, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and the International Monetary Fund, the so-called Bretton Woods institutions uh, created on the east coast of, uh, of, the, uh, of the states. And their uh, initial role, of course, a lot of it was about recreating a, a peaceful and more stable and more secure world after the devastation of, of conflict, uh, but also providing the resources and help uh, required for Europe to return to, uh, to uh, normality, to, to rebuild it after the devastation of the, of the conflict. 
Um, and the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the clue is in the name, um, you know, initially focused very much on rebuilding war-torn Europe, supported very much by the US and the so-called Marshall Plan, which put a huge amount of uh, resource and, and energy into helping to rebuild uh, the, the, the countries of Europe. Now, the whole um, uh, debate uh, has to be seen in the broader sort of politico, political um, uh, international uh, context of the time. And the end of the Second World War, of course, signalled the beginnings, anyway, of um, a, a quieter sort of conflict, an ideological conflict, the, the, the Cold War. So um, the, the whole notion of, of aid and development became linked in to um, supporting your friends, uh, giving them resources to, to, to build up their economies as part of that ideological struggle. And the second very important factor that was um, sort of there in the, in the, after the Second World War through the 50s and 60s was um, uh, the decolonization process. Many, many countries in, in Asia and then subsequently in Africa gaining their independence in the, in the late 50s and, and in the 1960s. And of course, you know, wanting to maintain uh, the relationships with the former um, uh, global powers uh, like the UK, uh, like, like the Spanish, like the Portuguese, like the French uh, uh, and, and others. So there were natural links between, um, as it were, the, the, the global north and the global south. And these are, these are terms which I know Nalima will, will, will be um, taking uh, to, to task and looking at in a very sort of critical way when she comes to her presentation. But, but basically, you know, we saw the rich world uh, and the poor world in those days, the rich north and the poor south. And it was complicated by the east-west dynamic. Um, the sort of communist uh, East and the capitalist uh, West, to put it in, in, in very simple terms. And, and aid relationships were, were formed uh, within that overall political context. Issues like human rights uh, weren't so important. They didn't really feature. The important thing for the aid relationship was on which side of the political divide uh, that relationship was, was formed. Um, that's not to say that serious thinking wasn't going on about poverty, about serious economic development for the partner countries. Uh, and uh, within the OECD, within the Development Assistance Committee, that thinking was going on. And in, the in, in 1970, an agreement was made that um, the developed countries, the members of the DAC, would contribute 0.7% of their gross national income uh, to international development. Um, so that was that was uh, that that was done uh, then, and, and a few years later, the British government actually wrote, wrote a white paper called "More Help for the Poorest." So this notion of of getting to poor people, uh, helping uh, them to develop, uh, as well as as poor countries, uh, was there from the beginning, but was overshadowed perhaps by that ideological framework which I've which I've mentioned. A lot of aid and development then, very much about um, uh, infrastructure development, uh, about economic support, rather than getting right down to the grassroots uh, level. Now, a couple of really important historical events um, happened subsequently. First, um, the end of 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that, as it were, um, took away that ideological framework within which people had thought about aid and development previously. And a condition for uh, a number of the countries in Eastern and Central Europe to become part of the international community, to join the European community as, as it then was, et cetera, were to improve their record on human rights, uh, to uh, democratize, uh, to have free and fair elections, et cetera, et cetera. This is what many of those countries wanted to do anyway. Um, and um, they put those into, um, into effect with support from, uh, from the West, but largely under their own steam. And people began to think, well, you know, if these are the conditions that um, um, uh, have to be in place for us to have aid and development relationships with, uh, with them, then perhaps we should be thinking more about these countries in relation to that relationship with uh, countries in Africa, with uh, countries in Asia, et cetera, et cetera, and the emerging economies. And so those 
uh, considerations around rights, uh, democratization, et cetera, et cetera, became much more embedded into the practice of, of, of aid uh, programs. And in the 1990s, a number of sort of key international conferences took place around food and right to food, uh, around education, around health. And um, by the middle of that 1990s, um, uh, there was beginning to be a sort of uh, movement around a set of international development targets, which focused uh, very much on poverty, uh, poverty reduction, and very much on basic health and um, and, and basic primary schooling for, for children and bringing girls in particular into, into primary education. Those international development targets became enshrined subsequently in what we call the Millennium Development Goals. Um, uh, agreed um, actually in 2001, uh, but uh, with those very same principles uh, at their heart. Halving the proportion of people living in absolute poverty by 2015 and making significant progress on a number of indicators, uh, as I've suggested, around uh, basic health and primary uh, education. It took a little while for those to take root. Um, it took four or five years for them to really, be, you know, become become entrenched. But it did happen, and um, and many um, uh, emerging economies, developing countries, took them to heart uh, and began to put them at the centre of their of their uh, development strategies. Now, there was another big shock a little bit further along the road, and that was, of course, the two thousand and eight financial. Uh, crisis. The, uh, th that kind of model of the world and how it worked, the rich north, poor south uh, model, began to look uh, increasingly dodgy as time went on. Because after 2008 and 2009, what became increasingly apparent was that the economies of the so-called rich north were in serious jeopardy. Uh, and uh, many countries in the so-called poor south were doing extremely well, uh, with economies growing at 7, 8, 9, 10% a year through their own efforts, through their own volition. Of course, in China uh, and India, uh, but in many other countries in Southeast Asia as well, and in, and in Africa. So by the time we got to 2015, the world looked re really a, a very different place from, from it had looked um, uh, even 10 years before, but certainly uh, 20, 20 years before. We had a sense that um, the world was making progress. And um, if you looked at the targets, uh, the, the Millennium Development Goals and the progress against those, well, two or three years before their uh, end date, um, we had succeeded between us in halving the proportion of people in the world living in absolute poverty. Uh, we had made progress against all the other goals, some of it very significant in terms of education, uh, getting children into school, others less, other, less significant on, on some of the health issues, but nevertheless, there was real progress. And I think that, um, you know, that sense at the end of 2015, was a pretty positive one. People had an international outlook. Uh, we had had the Financing for Development Conference. Uh, above all, we had had two huge uh, major uh, uh, conferences which had, had led to international agreements. First of all, uh, in September uh, 2015, uh, the agreement on the Sustainable uh, Development Goals as part of that, uh, as part of that discussion. And, and second, um, of course, the uh, Paris Agreement on, on climate change uh, at the end of the year. So um, things look pretty good at the end of uh, 2015. The world was, um, was, was uh, globalization uh, was there. People generally saw that as a positive uh, force. We had agreement on these um, sustainable development goals. Um, and, and they're up on the screen there. Everybody will be familiar with them. Um, it's not always possible to remember uh, what they all are and, and, and uh, all the 169 targets underneath them, but think of them as the five Ps uh, of people, of prosperity, of planet, of peace, and of partnerships. Partnerships, because development is not just done by governments, uh, but it's done by governments and civil society and the private sector. 
and the big difference between the Sustainable Development Goals and their predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals, is that these are universal goals. They're for everybody. They're not just for poor countries, rich countries, middle-income countries. Everybody uh, has to do them, uh, or everybody signed up to do them, and they are reviewed regularly, and that has happened at the UN over the past um, uh, four or five years. After the end of 2015, the world changed uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, I think, first of all, um, you know, the political environment is, is so important. And I think in the US, uh, in particular, there was a more inward-looking dynamic which came into play. I think uh, in the UK as well, there was a more inward-looking dynamic which was reflected in the decision to leave the European Union. Um, and uh, perhaps less focus than there had been before on rights uh, and democratization. And I think many um, sort of um, leaders in, in other parts of the world took their lead from this. And I think we have seen a, a strong increase actually in strongmen um, uh, running their countries, paying less attention to those uh, critical issues around uh, human rights, et cetera, over the past um, uh, four or five years. And some of them using coronavirus as an excuse, frankly, to embed that power and to hang on to power when they should have uh, given it up before. So the old dynamic of, of, of aid and development, of, of, of rich and poor, of north and south and east and west, uh, really is, is, is gone. We have to think of this world of ours, uh, the only world we have, uh, as being one for which we are uh, all responsible in, in, in equal measure. Um, and um, to which, you know, we all need to contribute to turning it into a, a better and more secure a more stable uh, place. And I think coronavirus, you know, has really um, helped to sharpen uh, the choices that we face. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, in, in some countries, um, it, has, it has heightened that sense of let's look after ourselves. Let's look inwards. We need to protect ourselves before uh, before we protect um, uh, other people. But uh, I, I think coronavirus um, has also generated a much stronger sense that we can only address global problems through global cooperation. Uh, and um, whether you're talking about pandemics uh, like coronavirus or, or you're talking about um, uh, other existential issues like climate change, it is only possible to address uh, those issues by working together. And those people who are fearful about uh, their health or whatever and want to shut people out need to recognize that you can't do that. And the only way in which you can assure uh, health globally is to make sure that everybody gets access to vaccines or, or whatever uh, uh, globally. So this, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm leading into the the, uh, the presentation that Nalima will will, will make short, uh, shortly. This leads us into uh, certain ways in which we need to think differently uh, about how the world is uh, and how it operates. The power structures of the world are still pretty much. Uh, reflected um, uh, in, in the power structures that existed back in the mid-1940s. So the United Nations system, for example, still dominated by the Security Council, the five permanent members, uh, they're very much reflecting the sort of power dynamic of the mid-1940s. The Development Assistance Committee of the OECD, which has done some brilliant work over the, over, over the past um, uh, 70 years or so, but uh, needs to take into account more, I know they're trying to do this, uh, the views of uh, the non-members of the Development Assistance Committee. How can we create the structures that will allow um, all countries in the world to have an equal say over this planet, uh, which, we all, uh, which we all own and which we all have a duty to protect? So there's a lot of thinking going on around what those changes might look like, um, uh, how uh, uh, all countries can be involved, be involved in this in a more equal way, how we can set up mechanisms which will move us towards uh, a more equal 
political structure, uh, but also a, a more equal financial structure. How about, for example, if instead of um, you know, the better off countries moving away from the 0.7% uh, uh, agreement, how about if all countries contributed 0.7% uh, uh, of their income? Uh, and there are mechanisms now, like the Gavi, like the Global Fund, for example, where countries do contribute, even very poor countries, uh, because they know they will benefit from this. So, how about um, um, all, all countries contributing something to these um, uh, these funds? You know, whether it's a single fund or, or a multitude of funds, uh, which um, you know will address uh, issues that affect us all, like climate or environmental degradation or whatever. We need to move away somewhat from the, from the old uh, dynamic, the old way we have of, of, of thinking about things and think about things in a new way, which empower people. We need to uh, recognize that, um, as SDG 5 uh, says, you know, this is, this is also about equality. This is also about empowerment of people. It's not just about uh, uh, getting rid of uh, uh, poverty, but it's about taking account of of, of, of equal opportunities, giving equal opportunities for all. So there are lots of ideas floating around at the moment about how that can be done, uh, how we can reduce those uh, inequalities, uh, what sort of mechanisms might be put in place, how we can empower um, countries which have traditionally not had a seat at the top table to uh, have more say in, in how we run this world of ours. So th at that point, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Nalima, who I know has been doing a huge amount of, of thinking around some of these ideas and the different sort of dynamic between donors, uh, recipients in, in traditional uh, terms. And then um, between us, we will, uh, Rachel, do our best to answer the questions which you will direct at us, I've no doubt. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Miles. Um, you're a very tough act to follow. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the breadth of your knowledge and the sweep of the historical uh, landscape that you presented um, is really very impressive. Um, I am going to just try and share my screen. Um, so I want, I've titled this presentation Donorship in Flux, and I will touch upon some of the, the historical um, genesis of, of aid in it. Um, but before I do, and in case I run out of time, presentation is really structured around three main statements. The first is that the idea of do um, Northern donorship, particularly the normative context for Northern donorship is facing some serious headwinds. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to present all of them, but I'll present a flavor of them. Um, the, the second point is that these headwinds are really weakening donor identities um, and what we understand to be good donorship. And, and lastly, and I think this point is at this point is more conjecture than, <laughs> than perhaps fact, but I, donorship and through it aid will be transformed in the process. But how is the question at this point? And as Miles said, there's several ideas out there, um, but I think it's still, still to be seen, um, particularly in the context of a post-coronavirus world, what will happen to the idea of a donor and through it, um, the idea of foreign aid. So, um, what is Northern donorship? And here's where I kind of revert back to, to that historical uh, moment post-war, particularly point four of um, US President Truman's inaugural speech, which problematized underdevelopment. Um, and that really unveiled uh, against the backdrop of, of a Cold War that was emerging and a desire to contain communism uh, globally. Now, in the, in the 1950s, the U.S. sought to promote this idea of overseas giving, and Paul Hoffman, the formal Marshall Plan administrator, was sent out and in charge, charged with selling the idea um, of aid giving to European countries that had benefited from U.S. aid a decade earlier. And by the end of the 1960s, all European countries had commenced some kind of program uh, of aid giving beyond national borders um, with new organizations and new professionals, essentially creating a new institutional field, which we now call um, the global development space. Um, 
but why did states become donors? So what was the motivation and the, the source of, of donorship? And I think it's twofold. And, and um, Liam Swiss and I present this in, in a paper published in the Canadian Journal of Development Studies um, and then expound on it on a, in a chapter in a, in a book recently published by Rutledge called Day of Politics and Power. Um, but first is this idea of the status as a donor. So to be a donor really is to exercise power. Um, the idea of being able to give a gift, to use those Masian terms, um, is a source of legitimacy um, that reflects hard power of a state, the financial resources to do it, as well as their soft power, the capacity to gift those resources. And it signifies a country as a modern developed state, um, creating essentially a class of nations um, so states are really negotiating their role, identity and power vis-a-vis -vis the international system at this particular moment. But a second way we might understand the rise of donorship is what it means to be a good donor. So as opposed to just having the institutional structure to, to act as a donor, it involves something about the norms and values around what good donorship would be. And, and David Lumsdane in his classic work talked about a moral vision and how moral vision has really shaped um, the global aid regime, um, its creation in particular. And so when I talk about Northern donorship, I'm really referring to both the status of states as donors, wealthy countries as donors, but also status of being a good donor. And the idea of what Northern donorship is, is really a product of interests and values um, of their time. And that can change over time. Um, so what we saw in 1949 is very different from what we mean by donorship in, in 2020. Um, now, briefly, just to kind of articulate some of these headwinds um, that are challenging, um, you know, the, the, the donorship, the idea of donorship that I think Miles left us off at in 2015, if you're pointing to kind of the apex of, of progressive donorship. Um, and I just want to touch upon two, but suffice it to say that they both exist at the, the domestic level and at the international level and are an interplay between um, those two levels of analysis. But at the domestic level, I think we cannot underestimate um, fiscal pressures and the role that fiscal pressures play um, in making it much harder to justify overseas expenditures to domestic taxpayers. Um, and I think we saw this in the aftermath of the financial crisis in 2008, and we're seeing it again um, right now in the context of the coronavirus crisis. Um, and this I, I attribute to several factors, but I think one could potentially argue that the SDGs, the universality of the SDGs, um, gives justification to populist politicians in particular to say there are development needs at home. Um, and you know, prominent economists like Angus Deaton have even argued that um, under development in the inner city ghettos of New York City is equivalent to what you might find in the worst slums uh, of Brazil, for example. So. Um, I think that potentially justifies this, this, this fiscal argument um, for cutting aid budgets. Um, and I think also aid skepticism is another driver for you know, the, 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 the narrative for justifying aid uh, and the, the kind of empirical evidence for it is continuously challenged. And, um, and in the UK in particular, if you're thinking about the UK context, um, I think the media scrutiny in particular of aid has been somewhat unfair, but also eroded public confidence perhaps in aid. Um, one of the global pressures that I think we also can't underestimate is the shifting geography of global poverty. Um, not only is the purpose of a donor in middle income countries the source of ongoing debate, um, but also southern providers of South-South cooperation are upending distinctions between donor and recipient um, and providing a source of competition, for many a valuable source of competition for others um, a more insidious one. Um, and I think this plays itself out against rising Sino-American tensions, um, always have always existed, and I think claims to a new Cold War might be exaggerated, and yet this tension blunts the practice and potential of aid and of donors um, as each side targets allocations to client states um, and uh, offers a sort of somewhat mixed record for development, per se. So these headwinds, um, what are they? What are they doing? What are they? What are they um, doing? And I think, at one level, I think they're weakening donor identity. 
Um, and you know, you'll see the the slide. You know, somewhat um, <laughs> a somewhat sad uh, tale. Uh, but I think you know, with with the merger of DFID, we we no longer have an independent development ministry um, in in the DAC. Um, and you know, this merger was about political control of a budget and an agenda. Um, and you know, many conservatives uh, members of parliament have suggested that one could have safeguarded British values and interest um, through the existing institutional structure of DFID and the FCO with far less cost and upheaval. Um, but the fact that DFID, um, with, with its reputation and the size of its budget, was vulnerable, I think really reflects the slow demise of donor di identity since 2013 with the Canadian and Australian mergers, which, and this identity is intimately tied with the aid project. Um, I think another way one might think about a weakening donor identity is in terms of the rise of Southern providers of development assistance who reject calling themselves donors, importantly. Um, they don't reject the idea of receiving Northern aid. In fact, the BAPA plus 40 declaration, um, which was a, a declaration of, of Southern, um, Southern identity and South-South cooperation really stated clearly that South-South cooperation is no substitute for North-South cooperation but they do reject the identity of a donor, even though 75 countries have domestic institutions of aid giving, uh, some of which include the, the least developed countries of the world. Um, and I think what's interesting um, is in contrast to a previous period of the DAC where uh, maturing modern countries moved from donor to recipient, these emerging providers can co have coexistent identities as both provider and recipient, which is so very different from the earlier understanding of what it meant to be a donor and how one got to being a donor. A second way I think these headwinds are, are challenging donorship is in the meaning of donorship itself. Um, Northern donors are discursively presenting themselves as um, seeking mutual benefits or win-wins. So the idea of enlightened self-interest as opposed to a kind of purist moral vision is I think one of the big changes from the, the early post-war period. And I think um, if you look at donor strategies, uh, which we have done um, through the Overseas Development Index in, in various country profiles of how donors um, explain why they give aid, you will see an enlightened self-interest self rationale uh, prevalent in the these narratives. And I think this is understandable. So I think in a world which is facing shared threats, disinformation, pathogens, climate change, but also intimately linked through travel, supply chains, migration, wealthy states can, can no longer uh, insulate themselves from the effects of events elsewhere. And Sarah Bermeo in her book, Targeted Development, has, has argued this, that the key to prosperity in wealthy states now increasingly depends on conditions in poor areas. And she distinguishes this from the Cold War period Period where um, the achievement of development was really inconsequential. It was actually the ability to cultivate allies that was more important. Whereas now, um, the ability to deliver on development is very much in Northern country interests. Um, at the same time as we have this logic of an enlightened self-interest, moral visions of donors are increasingly driven by a much more narrow parochial idea, a self-regarding ideal. And I think that this graph, which I've put up here, um, shows that in the current um, in the current principal aid index, the 2020 version of the principal aid index, we can show that donors are uh, instrumentalizing aid for short-term gain based on a series of metrics that, that we've put in place. So the bulk of the donors have experienced a decline in their score over the 2017-2018 period. Um, principal nationalism would involve a commitment to unselfish public-spirited behaviors, recognizing their long-term interests um, in achievement of development. Um, but almost all donors showed a decline in public spiritedness on the index, suggesting some degree of instrumentalization. With interestingly, Sweden doing particularly badly on measures of tied aid, especially informally tied aid. Um, so where does that leave us? Um, so just quickly, I think we recognize that donorship will be transformed as the balance between values and interest shifts. Um, how it's defined and organized, though, are, are open questions for the minute. 
And I think there are some coronavirus unknowns. So, you know, as countries hijack planes um, to divert ventilators and N95s to their last minute highest bidders, I think one might have uh, seen this as the end of global solidarity as we knew it. Um, and I think we can see that in terms of how aid finance in particular is going to be under stress, um, least of all due to the falling GNI ratios um, for those countries that target their aid spending according to their uh, growth. Um, so I think we are likely to see 0 0.7 as a policy target, um, diluted, um, if not perhaps reconceived. And, I, and Miles suggested a few ideas on how we might do that. Um, however, you might also see this epoch as an opportunity um, to the extent that we all share vulnerability to a very virulent pathogen. Um, and so you could potentially see global challenges framed as security imperatives. Um, negative externalities are much more obvious post-corona and, and arguably sit within the mandates of the foreign ministries that now control the aid budgets. Um, so they sit well within um, the kind of framing of foreign policy in particular. So I think we, we can expect to see multilateral commitments to flow um, to tackle global challenges. And I think there will be legacy effects of this crisis. So, and, and how that plays out are still, are still unknown, but I think the mutual aid movement that we've seen in local communities to tackle the pandemic is something that we can build on. Um, by contrast, vaccine nationalism might risk creating a risk to the bottom. Um, we've shown that the world can mobilize resources at speed and scale. Uh, for things that matter, and perhaps that can galvanize um, or reduce some of those fiscal pressures. Scientific collaboration is an unprecedented basis for global cooperation, um, and localism has proven, I think. So what changes do we expect from bilateral programming? So I think there will be legacy effects, um, but I think there are also unknowns. Um, so with that, I will close. Um, there are a few references there. If, if anyone is interested, or feel free to email me and happy to provide some. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. So this is, you've both provided a lot of food for thought for all of us. Um, I see there are some questions here in the Q&A, but I'd encourage uh, those in the audience to please uh, start and continue sending your questions. I have a number of questions, but I think why don't we turn over to one of the, the members of the audience. Um, let's, hopefully this works here. Uh, I'll turn over to Rebecca Tinsley, who has a question for both of you. Thank you both for your presentations. That was really helpful and interesting. Um, my concern is how we make sure that aid uh, goes to uh, things that citizens need and want, as opposed to what their leaders might say that their countries want. Um, for example, a country like Nigeria, which is a democracy, uh, the leaders might say that they want to build football stadiums because of the status that brings them, whereas uh, cities as large as Jos, uh, with millions of uh, residents, still don't have running water or reliable electricity. So how do we, donors, um, make sure that the aid is going to, uh, to, to uh, the goals the, of citizens rather than uh, leaders? Thank you. Uh, Miles and Nalima, would you like to respond to this question or would you like to collect a few questions? Oh, my brain can only hold one or two at a time, Rachel. So I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy to have a little crack at, uh, crack at Becky's question there. I mean, this is difficult because, um, because donors um, get told off regularly for imposing, quote, conditionality, unquote, and saying precisely how uh, uh, aid funds should be used and trying to impose their own priorities on, on governments. I think just a couple of things. I think, first of all, um, that um, donors can reasonably expect um, countries, uh, emerging economies, to have a strategy in place setting out um, how they propose to take their countries forward in terms of uh, economic and social development. Indeed, this really came into play in the, in the late um, 1990s. And, um, and in terms of their relationship with the World Bank, 
countries were asked to draw up uh, the so-called Poverty Reduction Strategy Papers, PRSPs, to set out precisely how they proposed to take forward the development uh, of their countries um, uh, in response to concerns by the World Bank and the donor community that they could feed into that process and to develop um, country ownership. The other part of the question, you know, how do we ensure that um, uh, what governments ask for reflect what citizens actually want? Um, you know, I think the SDGs provide that framework um, for countries to um, uh, consult uh, their citizens um, uh, about priorities. These are supposed to be um, consultative documents and an increasing number of countries the world over I mean, including in Finland, uh, but also in, in, in countries in Latin America, um, Ghana, in, in Africa, for example, you know, have, have taken this point very seriously about, um, about a national framework for development with the SDGs at their, at their basis. And SDG 16, you know, is the crucial one, the one that was most difficult to get agreement on um, uh, when the discussion's happening. Uh, around peace and justice and strong institutions. And there, the, there's lots of language around rights uh, and around um, civic responsibility and, and getting um, uh, consultation mechanisms going. I think all we can do uh, as donors is to ensure that uh, there are processes in place for democratic elections. None of us as citizens always get the precise governments we want. Uh, and sometimes when governments come into power, they do things that we haven't uh, voted for those paths. But I think that's all we can expect, really, uh, whatever um, state uh, a country's in, whether it's um, had democracy in, in place for hundreds of years or whether they're new democracies. Thanks. Rachel, can I come in? Yes, please do. <laughs> great. Um, it's a great question. And I think there, there are several layers to the problem <laughs> that the question identifies. The first is you have elites at two levels. You have elites in the donor countries who are making decisions, which perhaps don't always match up with needs in developing countries. But then you also have elites of developing countries who potentially are intermediaries. The principle of sovereignty essentially limits the hands of the donor nation to be able to necessarily engage, engage with the individual citizen. Too often those channels occur through the elites of those developing countries. But I think they're perhaps a couple of ideas that might be um, uh, might be worth thinking about in terms of how to to match donor desires for for development with citizen needs and I think the first is um, the channels of, of finance that are that are used so I think um, the ability to give directly to local NGOs and civil 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 rights movements, um, you know, thinking women's movements, for example, in the context of, of gender equality is really critical. Um, and you know, some of the work that we've been doing has shown that even though most countries have formally untied their aid informally, the practice of aid giving is still very much tied to northern NGOs, often the larger international ones. And so really um, creating conduits of finance to be able to at least work with small scale actors on the ground. And that's not an easy challenge. This issue of scale is another uh, thing to, to be discussed. But nonetheless, I think thinking more critically about the channels with which we engage at the local level is important. Uh, and I also think there is value in, in coming back to these ideas of cash transfers as a potential way to, um, to give um, to the local level, the argument being that those at the local level are best placed to decide how to spend that money uh, and do tend to spend it well. Um, so I think those might be two ideas uh, to consider as well. Wonderful. Um, so I wanted to jump in with a question that sort of follows on from, from this discussion. You know, there's been a lot of discussion recently about a global decline in democracy. Um, Freedom House, the Varieties of Democracy Project, uh, Civicus Monitor, and so on, have reported that we see sort of pronounced democratic backsliding since the early 2000s. And I wonder your thoughts on, on how um, aid fits into this, um, <laughs> and especially uh, 
sort of the impact of um, emerging donors uh, in this whole uh, possible trend, <laughs> because uh, you know there's as you, uh, Nilima, as you mentioned, there's a you know there is concern that emerging donors have sort of dif different norms around um, around um, around uh, aid and conditionalities and uh, democ democracy and so on. So I wonder your thoughts on that. Miles or Nalima, please. I, well, shall I just? I mean, I'll, I'll kick him first, and then I'll let Nalima give the real answer afterwards. But you know, <laughs> I think that I think that kind of um, sort of liberal international consensus that built from the end of 1989 um, and which continued through the, the 90s and into the 2000s and um, perhaps came to a peak, as I said before, um, you know, at the end of 2015. That consensus has been broken. Uh, and it's partly, um, you know, the Trump uh, factor, uh, I think has been, a, you know, to be honest, um, has been a really important uh, factor in this that, um, you know, the US, which um, on the whole has been on the side of, of progress and development and, and putting resources in and, and caring about the state of the world, that has not been apparent uh, over the last five years. And I think um, a, a lot of other countries have taken their cue from that, frankly. Uh, and so in Brazil or Hungary, or, or various other countries across the world, leaders have uh, said, "Well, if it's if it's okay for the U.S. to do that, you know, we can do it. We can uh, we we can um, shift the dynamic in, in our countries too." I hope, um, I, I very much hope that we will see a change back and a return to that sort of shift forward, a, recogni a recognition that, uh, as a world, we're only going to make progress by inclusion, uh, inclusion of governments, but inclusion of, of civil society by everybody working together uh, and uh, recognizing that only thus are we going to make, you know, a world that, uh, that we're going to be able to live in well. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I think this question is, um, is interesting. And I think I'm going to give one example of how donors see aid fitting into this question of democracy um, promotion, and then perhaps um, suggest that it might not be the right way <laughs> and offer a potential alternative. So in terms of how donors are thinking about this, I just want to give the example of um, press freedom in particular in the South. So there's clearly uh, been a decline in press freedom globally, and that's particularly been felt in, um, in many uh, non-democratic uh, states. And there's been an initiative launched by Luminate, um, a, a large foundation, to bring donors together to try and fund independent media in the global South, recognizing that there are inherent challenges to their business model, um, particularly with the rise of platforms like Facebook and, and Twitter and so on, uh, but also state controlled media um, can provide a huge subsidy to um, state controlled media. And so as a result, you, you, you have independent media really floundering financially. And so the idea is to create a fund to support um, independent media. Now the real challenge there is to what extent developing countries, sovereign states, are going to allow a global fund, largely funded by the North and international institutions, to transfer finance to the South to support independent media. Um, that can be seen quite th as quite threatening um, and, and a violation of the principles of sovereignty and non-interference that Southern donors or providers respect. Um, and I, I pay respect in quotes because I think there are various examples of them not respecting that. But nonetheless, the, the normative discourse around what Southern provision is, is very much one of non-interference, non-conditionality and horizontality. So I think there are fundamental problems with that, but I think donors themselves are grappling with that issue uh, at the minute. Um, perhaps a better way, however, is for donors to be investing in a multilateral system that is more robust, that can engage in some of the conversations and the, those normative questions to build consensus around uh, what democracy means, accepting its varieties <laughs> across the world. Um, and so perhaps that might be a more productive way to engage in those conversations than, than the idea of fund. Although I think the idea of you know working 
on something like media freedom also suggests donors are engaging in a much more politicized understanding of what aid is, potentially moving beyond the, the technocratic aid, uh, critique of aid, um, which I think is promising. I just think there's some certain structural weaknesses to the idea that might need to be grappled with. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions here. I think we have time for two more questions and I'm gonna ask um, the two uh, people posing these questions to ask them live and then we'll give you a chance to respond uh, together to those questions at the, in our last 10 minutes here. So I think I'll turn um, first to Ricardo Santos, if I may. Ricardo, are you there? Hello, can you hear yes. me? Hi, Ricardo, we hear you. Hi, thank you. So first of all, thank you for the presentation. It was uh, very thought provoking. Um, so it may be a little bit unfair, but I felt that to a great deal, the presentations offered an, a perspective of how narratives mostly and practice changed from the perspective of, of an increasingly wider and diverse group of donors. But has the experience of said recipient countries and communities changed that much? So are there any signals that the power of the gift is waning and that donors are indeed improving their practices, namely in terms of predictability, coherence, and temporal consistency? Or as I registered years ago as a development studies student, uh, hearing of a wise researcher, ownership is still a mantra in development because we are still way too far from making it real. Thanks, Ricardo. So we have another question here from Irene, and I'm trying to ask her to unmute. Uh, let's see if it works. If not, I'll pose the question. Okay. Well, the, the question is, um, yes, oh, Irene, there you go. Yes. So uh, this is Irene together with a few colleagues from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Hello. Uh, just looking at the different models that seem to be emerging in terms of development aid, would uh, there be a comment around this? Because uh, there's a, a different approach if you look at how maybe the Scandinavian countries, this is Sweden predominantly, and uh, the other Western countries approach are approaching aid at this point in time. Maybe any perspectives from the panelists on that? Wonderful, thank you. So over to you, Miles and Nilima. I can start since Miles has started a few. I don't actually see Miles anymore on my screen, but- Yeah, um, I don't see him either, but please start. <laughs> no, so on the first question, um, Unfortunately, I don't think there's much evidence of, of donors changing their practices in terms of predictable financing and some of the other metrics you suggested. And I think um, I, I saw a recent table, I think, pulled from the GPDC, which is the kind of aid effectiveness monitoring that, that really um, was sobering um, on, that, uh, on that score. Um, but what signals do we see from recipient countries. And I think that's that's the really interesting space for, for change. You're right. We're very much looking at the supply side. Uh, and I think um, the, the word of aid and donor leads you to look at the supply side. But I think that the demand the demand side, for, for lack of a better word, is, is where there, the change is maybe more dramatic. And I think the rise of um, southern providers of development assistance in particular is changing the, 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 the terms of the conversation between North and South. And if anything, I think um, recipients or, or, or southern actors have the upper hand at the minute. Um, I think there are some worries that the, um, the, the current global context is resulting in convergence to norms and standards that um, are not up to the kind of traditional standard of what we mean by donorship, whether that be the financial commitments or um, the values of partnership or ownership, as you say. Um, and I think that those are valid concerns, but those are, those are being driven partly by I think what's happening on the side of Southern providers and, and the normative um, justifications that they provide for engaging in other countries of the South. Um, I don't, that probably doesn't answer your question fully, but hopefully it gives a flavor of, of where I'm coming from. Um, on the Nordics, um, the source of their uniqueness, um, I'm not an expert in, in Nordic aid history, 
but there is, um, I know in the context of the way their development um, aid ministries have been organized in particular, um, the idea of a specialized agency focused on development is very much in keeping with a constitutional tradition in Scandinavia for several agencies and very few ministries. Um, and agencies have a lot of power in, in Scandinavia, in, in thinking of Sweden in particular, compared to ministries perhaps elsewhere in, in, oh, in, in, in Sweden, but also in other parts of the world, and, and have a lot of autonomy. And I think that is potentially one reason why they've been able to um, keep their development aid programs at arm's length from some of the foreign policy imperatives that otherwise tend to infuse um, development programming, that, that long constitutional history of, of separation of powers. Um, I don't know if Miles has anything to add, but that would be my kind of historical view of, of some of the differences from Scandinavia. That's great. Uh, we seem to have lost Miles. I think there's been some technical glitch. So <laughs> hopefully he can come in in the last few minutes to, to say some closing words. Um, I'm wondering if I should take maybe one more quick question. Uh, Liam Swiss, I think, has a question. We've got five more minutes. So pose it quickly and then we can get a, a, some closing remarks from Nilima and hopefully from Miles as well. <laughs> so Liam, please. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you, Nalima. Uh, I think you raise an interesting point uh, in response to one of the earlier questions about the localization process that's kind of been pushed ahead a bit by the COVID uh, context, right? The fact that Western donor agencies and their proxies and, and NGOs and whatnot haven't been able to uh, travel and kind of be in recipient countries in the same way. And we see uh, localization and, and local actors may be stepping in to fill some of those um, gaps that evolved because of the pandemic. What do you think the prospects are for that continuing post-pandemic, assuming we get to some sort of uh, normal again? And, and if we see greater localization, what are the prospects for um, favorability of aid if it means a diminishing role for the aid sector in donor countries? I didn't fully understand the second part of the question, that if we see localization. If there's increased localization and it means a diminishing role for Western-based NGO actors, consultancies, okay. uh, donors okay, themselves. Uh, yeah. yeah, great, thanks. Okay, so on your first, will it continue? Um, I mean, the changes to the world of work generally <laughs> are so dramatic. Um, I, I can't see how we are going to go back to, to any normal, frankly, um, what was before in, in any space of, of the world of work. And I think perhaps um, in, in the development sphere in particular, um, the combination of the, the climate crisis um, in particular, I think, really begs the question of the value of flying around the world um, for you know, two-day meetings. Um, and I think technology has shown how um, we can still be engaged without necessarily being present. So I suspect that we are not going back to a previous world and that the localization trends that we've seen will continue in some form, uh, certainly more than they, they, um, they were previously. Um, and I think that does have implications for the role of Western-based NGOs and actors, um, particularly in the context of shrinking aid budgets. Um, I think donors um, like DFID, for example, are looking very carefully at, at who they want to invest in um, as intermediary channels. Um, and the, the crisis that many um, non-governmental organizations are facing to cover their overhead costs in particular um, is suggestive of, a, of, of, I think, a trend that will continue. Um, and I think um, it, that might not be a bad thing. Uh, I mean, time, time will tell, but I think it does definitely open the door for um, greater horizon horizontality between North and South. Um, and, and I think that is, is frankly what is, what is needed. Great. Thank you, Nalima. Um, so I just got a message here that unfortunately Miles has some internet 
issues. So I think that we will have to close the, the session today without him. But um, I thank both both Miles and Unilima for your for your really thought provoking presentations and and comments, and the audience also for the the questions. There are a couple more questions we didn't get to, and I think that they'll be shared with you you both after the the chat after the um, webinar. So thank you, everyone. Um, and uh, I think now we'll close uh, this, this uh, wider webinar. Thank you very much.